Hello and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Kelly Waldire. Thank you so much for tuning in again today. Today we're going to be talking about fine arts. And oftentimes when we think of fine arts, such as painting, sculpting, dancing, we think of these things as maybe a fun expression of life, but maybe not necessary. Today we're going to be talking with Roger Lee about why these things are so important to the education, and especially our youth, and some of the different forms of expression that fall under fine arts, and specifically dance. Roger, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Kelly. It's an honor to be here. So, just so our viewers know, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself? You're obviously a, a well-known dancer in the Philadelphia area, but you have a lot of instruction experience, um, not just being a professional, but teaching others as well. Well, thank you for that. See, I actually started teaching dance at the age of 12, which is extremely young. Uh, I needed some side money, and I said I really want to do something in my field. So I decided to run out my middle school, and I did every Sunday, you know, right after church time. I would use my middle school gym and ask the community to come out, pay a small fee, and take a hip-hop class with me. And it was weird, you know, having college kids and people who are a lot older than me come and learn from me. But now, thank God, 14 some years later, I'm actually teaching college. So it kind of all comes full circle. And you're an instructor here in Philly, but you also teach at the Joffrey Ballet, yeah. correct? Is yes. that is that what's called? Wow. That's yeah, it's awesome. a dream come true. I always grew up watching them and wanting to be a part of that school, but um, didn't know I'd be teaching there. So it's a real blessing. So when we talk about fine arts, there's a lot of different things that fall into that category, mm. more than just dance. And so you have experience with several different mediums and mm. encouraging people. What are some of these things that, that people are doing that fall under fine arts? Sure. Fine arts in the broad definition is really just an art form that you can study but also engage in. So a lot of times that can include painting, any visual art. It can be literary art such as poetry writing and creative writing. And then dance, of course. A lot of times people think of ballet as being you know, the highest of the mm. dance forms and the fine art. But we're starting to learn now that modern dance is just as much of a fine art you know, it's anything that you can really study and engage in. So I'm happy to see contemporary dance and street dance, all of these forms starting to come to the forefront and not just be street or vernacular forms, but actually high fine art forms as well. Now, I mentioned in my, my little intro there that a lot of people look at these sorts of things and they think that they're the things that we add on to mm -hmm. curriculum, the things we add on to our lives. They're maybe not necessary, but is it, is it safe to say that, that youth who find an active, committed interest in fine arts and these types of things are less likely to get involved in, say, criminal activities or things that they shouldn't? I would definitely say that. You know, I've had the privilege of teaching in a number of high schools here in Philadelphia, and a lot of times the students are involved in violence. So sometimes we catch them when they're already, you know, emerged in that type of lifestyle. But what I've seen is that Engaging in the arts actually provides hope for them to get out of that. Mm -hmm. So I had some students who were affiliated with gangs and things of that nature, but halfway through the semester they stopped, you know, missing class. They actually showed up early and stayed late and said, you know, I actually want to become good at dance and I don't really have time to be in the street. And for me, I said, wow, that provides some type of hope. Yeah, maybe they don't stop cold turkey, but it gives them another option. So when 3 p.m. hits, you could be dancing or you could be in the street, right? But a lot of them are starting to now pick the art over the violent lifestyle, and I think there's a lot of hope there, for sure. That's kind of nice that it doesn't necessarily have to, you don't have to start before they get into mm -hmm. that thing, but it's also providing hope for kids who maybe have seen what that lifestyle is like sure. and then say, wait a minute, I want to choose something else, I want to have another option, and mm -hmm. then they can get into these things. Which brings me to the point of really why it's so important that mm -hmm. these programs are being taught in schools because they are providing options for students. Oh, for sure. And I love what you said, too, about the arts normally being an add-on. I think if schools and school districts can start to integrate the arts into the academic curricula, then they'll also see a lot more transformation out of their students. So, you know, at Eastern University, I actually teach a course on arts integration where I train up-and-coming teachers on how to use the arts in their academic curriculum. So how can you use dance to teach math? How can you use music to solve an equation? Right? How can we use painting to teach science? I think if teachers are trained in that method of teaching, then the arts are not this thing that we have to fund necessarily outside of academia, but it's actually integrated already into the curriculum. And students see, while well, math is fun. I'm good at it, but I'm also good at this drawing thing. And they can kind of marry within the classroom. So. 
Do you think that a lot of students, if they're not exposed to these different forms of mediums, that, you know, they might not think, oh, I'm a good painter, or they might think that's for other people, but it's because that there's that lack of exposure? Oh, for sure. You know, I think it all starts in the household. So, you know, a lot of times an artist grew up around creative adults, whether it's the family or somebody close to them. And these people go on to become patrons and stewards of the arts up until they leave the earth, you know? So you see a lot of times 80-year-old donors to the ballet and stuff. That's normally because somebody instilled, you know, the arts in their lives at a very young age. But what happens when our kids aren't exposed to it during their elementary years is that it becomes extinct. They don't know about it, so then they don't engage in it, and then they never become donors for it either. Is it, is it harder to get a student to engage as they age? You know, so, you know, say high school, is it harder mm. to then get a student really actively interested in some of these things than it would be if you catch them earlier? For sure, especially with art forms such as dance where it's all about the body. So, you know, once the students hit puberty and things, they become more self-conscious and all of that. And it's not as cool to be doing hip hop, right, when you're 14 for the first time versus a five-year-old doing that who hasn't matured yet. So, um, it's definitely harder, but for me as an instructor, it's a unique challenge to just really get in there and make a difference. The nice <laughs> thing about it is, though, that there really isn't an age limit on any of these things. So no. whether you're five or whether you're 85, mm -hmm. you know, anybody could pick up dance for the first time or pick up painting for the first time. Oh, for sure. And I think people have to realize, too, that there are levels to art. So there is nothing wrong with just doing it for fun and for sheer enjoyment. You know, you don't have to be the next Picasso or Rembrandt or <laughs> Joe Myers Brown, right? You can just engage in the art form because you like it and because it brings you peace and serenity and there just should not be that pressure. You know, I think a lot of times people assume I have to be excellent at this to engage in it. Mm. So when they draw that picture and it's unidentifiable <laughs> as to what the picture is, they kind of give up and say art is not for me. It doesn't mean that, it just means maybe it's not your profession, but why can't you enjoy it? Well, this brings me to my, my next question is, you know, when we have these programs in school, mm -hmm. sometimes the kids are with their friends and they might feel self-conscious or they would have an opportunity to maybe go to a summer camp or mm -hmm. a specialized program or an after-school program where they're with a different group of people and they might not feel the same emotions about it. Is there a better setting for a student to learn or does it really matter? Hmm. That's a tough one. I think it all depends on the students. So, you know, sometimes we will go into a school after school and kids are in there with their best friends so if one doesn't want to dance the other one doesn't want to dance mm. so at that moment I say you know what Saturday programs are better for you because you can actually come alone meet new friends who actually want you to do well and you know kind of push forward but I think for kids that have no exposure to the arts it's almost uh, a bit foolhardy to believe that they'll just come to a Saturday class it's almost like you have to meet them where they are bring it into the school and then they realize wow this thing is cool and I like it but to ask an absolute beginner to commit to a Saturday program might be a, a bit much. Some of these forms are actually teaching um, youth and even grown-ups who are engaging in them lots of different um, like character building type mm -hmm. things. So this idea that you would be self-conscious in front of your friends is actually one of the things that you can sort of conquer exactly. in the arts, correct? Oh, for sure. Yeah, it builds self-esteem for sure. Uh, group work. You know what employer doesn't like that? Somebody is a team player and somebody is creative. You know, the arts are all about creative problem solving. It's kind of what we do professionally. You know, you just solve problems in a unique and authentic way. And I think it really makes students employable for sure. You know, and I know a lot of times that's a big concern for both the student and the parent. So they might say, you know, my child is great at dance, but do they actually have a lucrative future in it? Mm. You know, whether they go into dance or corporate America, the skills that you build within a dance studio are transferable and that makes you really unique and marketable. Talk to me a little bit about this idea of collaboration. How are the fine arts teaching children to collaborate with each other, teaching youth, whether children or, mm -hmm. or adults really? Yeah, again, I'll you know, stick with the dance model for now. So in the dance class, a teacher is showing a series of steps known as choreography or a dance routine. But a lot of times it's not a solo, right? It's a group piece. Mm -hmm. So. The students have to learn how to dance as one. How do you take 20 people of different ages and different backgrounds and make them move as one unit? Right? It takes a lot of team building just to do that. So you have to trust the people that you're dancing with, especially if there's partnering and lifting and things wow. going on where you could be hurt. You know, you have to have fun and trust these people. Um, so yeah, dance is a great way to just work in teams. And if you're shy 
helps you to come out that shell and really make some friends. What about some of the other ways? Um, you know, fine arts and, and dance certainly can, can help us learn to express emotions yeah. in ways that are nonverbal. Mm -hmm. And I think in today's day and age, you know, with social media and everything, mm -hmm. it feels like everybody's expressing things all the time, but sometimes we're hesitant to do that, and sometimes we're shy, and we can't really express our true selves. How is fine arts helping people to communicate things non-verbally? Yeah, I think fine arts is doing this because the whole goal is to, again, express yourself without limit, and also to realize there's no right or wrong. It's just kind of how you feel, all right? So for a student that's engaged in poetry, they may have had the most traumatic experience, but being able to write about it and not talk about it may really be the therapy that they need to kind of get over that hump in their life. So, you know, I've seen transformations where kids can't speak in the classroom about things. They're a little reluctant to work with their peers and even with me, but then you read their writing and you're like, oh my God, you <laughs> are brilliant, right? Like this actually happened to you and they're telling their stories and letting their spirits out on the page. Same thing with paintings. You know, I've seen students just kind of paint their heart out literally in ways that they kind of act or sing about. So, you know, each student will kind of find a medium that works for them. But I think overall the fine arts definitely encourages you to be authentic and to realize that there's no right or wrong, there's just your unique story, what God has given you, and there's a platform to share it. What about um, the ways in which the arts can help students understand and express um, their fears, but, but also conquer those fears? Because I think for a lot of us, being self-conscious or you know, the potential for failure, whatever mm. it is that is bound up in that art form, is mm -hmm. also something that we have to, to really get over. Yeah, no, we do. I think, again, with the dance piece, right, you may have this huge lift and you're really afraid of falling. And that was something I faced for years, whether I was being lifted or doing the lift, just dropping somebody, you know, being associated with that. And again, there's nothing like it when you actually hit the stage and finish that routine. Now, whether somebody fell or not, it's not really the point. The point is that you actually face that fear head on. And you said, you know, they could fall, they couldn't fall, but I'm going to at least put myself out there and try my hardest. There's something huge to be said about that, you know, and seeing students go out and do that every day, whether they pass or fail the assignment, just the fact that they're out there and trying to win at it, it's, it's inspiring to me and other teachers. It teaches perseverance yeah. as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that too? Well, for sure, yeah. The arts are pretty, you know, <laughs> Beautiful representation of perseverance. It's just the people who hang in there are the ones who actually do it professionally, right? So you may have had an awesome career, but the day that you stop pushing forward is the day that you become a history note. Um, so to succeed in the arts, you just have to have that tenacious spirit and always push forward. And I think that skill is transferable because a lot of students who come outside of artistic training, they're not afraid of life's challenges. So they may lose a job, they may have a failed marriage or whatever it is, but they find creative problem solving skills that we talked about you know, to push forward and turn and it the things. And it might take time. So mm -hmm. with something like dance, obviously, if you're starting at age five, you're not going to be really, really, really good at it until, yeah. you know, maybe 10, 15 mm -hmm. years down the road, correct? Exactly. So, yeah, within the arts, too, we have so many beautiful role models where we can see, okay, after a decade or two, this is where I can go with my gift. I mean, it really gives you something to aspire to. So you don't mind hanging in there for 20 years because you know what the end result could potentially be for you. Let's transition a little bit and talk specifically about dance. Now we've mentioned dance in the mm -hmm. context of fine arts, but let's let's you know get more into dance sure. and talk about some of these different types of dance that are so popular. And specifically, you know, maybe you can tell us more about the ones that you teach, mm -hmm. um, such as let's start with social dance. Yeah. You know, what does this mean, and what are what are people doing when they're they're socially dancing. Yeah, I think the goal of social dance is really just communicate with other humans in an awesome way. <laughs> Hopefully not in an awkward way, right? So there's always that fear of like... Yeah, it would be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so over the history, you know, American history, uh, social dance has emerged, you know, it's changed. It might have started out with, um, you know, a little boogaloo and then some break dancing in the late 80s and early 90s. And then, you know, hip hop is definitely taking over right now. Crump, um, you know, different styles within hip hop, you'll see certain dances that are identifiable, such as the nay-nay and the whip and things that 
are now universal okay, to kids yep, and adults. Yep. So not the genre of dance, but it's a style within social dance. So there's a lot that's happening right now. Now, are young people really into ballroom? That one, that, you know, you mentioned earlier, that's the one, one of the ones that people think is a little bit more high, mm -hmm. higher, fine art, whatever. Sure. Um, but are young people doing that? I think they are more than people realize. There are a number of organizations in Philadelphia and New York and even LA that are teaching ballroom specifically to middle schoolers. And I thought that was a really cool thing to do because, again, you're meeting them where they are, you're introducing them to you know, all the social graces and posture and all these cool things, but you're doing it during the school day where they have to try it out. And a lot of times those students go on to Saturday classes and they compete and have a great time with it. So um, I think there are a lot of kids around the world doing it. Now with, with ballroom specifically being taught in schools, that's kind of interesting because mm -hmm. you're, you're placing children in, you know, they have to learn to be in close proximity to one another. Mm -hmm. They have to learn to be respectful with one another. There's a lot of other skills that yeah. are going into it that have nothing to do with dance. Oh, for sure. Yeah, manners and grace and posture and just basic etiquette across the board is the focus of that. Now you're an instructor at the Joffrey Ballet. Mm -hmm. So ballet is one of the ones that, you know, everybody knows and I guess people think of when we think of dance, that's mm -hmm. often what we think of. Um, so clearly that's very popular with people. Yeah, ballet is uh, definitely one of the older art forms and it's kind of the one that is the basis for all dance. So whether you do go into hip hop or merengue or anything, there's just certain postural things that ballet teaches you that you can apply to all other dance forms. So. It kind of is like the godfather of dance, and I think it's beautiful. I think it teaches a lot of what ballroom teaches, you know, grace and just technique and posture and alignment and things that any dancer in any genre should definitely have a handle of. Now, suppose you were interested in hip hop, which is the next one on my list. Mm -hmm. Do you have to have a background in ballet, or can you just be a hip hop dancer and then if you become, you know, m more professional or whatnot, you would get a background in ballet? It's funny, it's actually my story. So uh, <laughs> I started out as a hip hop dancer okay. and took ballet a lot later and it was actually by force. You know, after going to a performing arts high school, it kind of was on the curriculum. But um, I thank God for that experience because it definitely broadened my dance ability and my knowledge of it. But I definitely want to say that uh, you can start out as a hip hop dancer for sure and then be exposed to ballet. But um, I don't know, I think sometimes there's a double standard, right? So dancers feel like I must take ballet all the time and like immerse myself in that to do other things but yet we don't expect the same of the ballet dancer so if you get oh, a ballet dancer that can't crump right nobody's saying you <laughs> must take like four levels of crump class or a break right. dancing class but a lot of times we demand that of our other dancers so um i do think there's kind of a double standard there although ballet is the basis you know i love when people specialize in something else and they say i definitely have a deep appreciation for ballet and i study it but I'm still a hip hop dancer at my core. And I think it's very important to know who you are as an artist. Now can learning, um, you mentioned ballet mm -hmm. and crumping. Yeah. Okay, now <laughs> can, can one of them sort of um, uh, interrupt the style of the other? Mm. You know, cause if you're a ballet dancer and you want to be like a prima ballerina, mm -hmm. you have a very specific goal. Exactly. Um, how are learning the different styles gonna help you achieve that goal? Hmm. Well, nowadays, even in professional ballet companies, um, I think a lot of people would be shocked to know that it's all contemporizing now, for lack of a better word. Um, things are becoming more contemporary in terms of choreographic process. So a choreographer might say, we are doing point, but we're going to do point in a straight jacket, or we're going to do point <laughs> with you know, okay. one arm up and one arm behind your back. So people are starting to apply contemporary principles even to the most classical art forms. So for that prima ballerina to have had experience in modern dance and contemporary and hip hop, it's only diversifying their palette and anything that that choreographer could ask of them, they can do it with ease. Whereas the ballet dancer that only trains in that, they may have a much harder time doing a role other than, you know, okay. Sugar Plum Fairy or something <laughs> of that nature. So, gotcha. Yeah. The versatility is key. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the physical benefits, sure. um, especially for young people. You know, we've been talking about getting them active at a young age, mm -hmm. but obviously dance is, you know, going to be good for you yeah. physically. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it definitely helps with your heart rate. Yeah, I like to believe it speeds up metabolism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's really good. Uh, it helps you with endurance, too. So, you know, for people that do running and all of that, that helps them out. But just for people who are just trying to maintain a certain level of health, having endurance to walk up a flight of stairs or 
to walk a block or two to your car, you know, things that some people take for granted. It can be a challenge to others, and I always say the dance is a great way to just keep a pretty standard level of health, you know? I've heard that ballet works every single muscle in your body yes. if you're doing like a full um, mm -hmm. routine Even or Even ones you don't know that you have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. So you're really working your musculature mm -hmm. too. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it definitely builds up the legs a lot, the calves, the quads. Also, um, your feet, you know, just being able to point and flex over and over. You know, I think that it really helps people um, not have arthritis over time or at least it prolongs that, you know, if that's genetic for you. Um, really helps the blood pressure and all of that just continue to flow through your body and prevent clots and things that can really be detrimental and fatal to us. Now, we, we think of um, like aerobic exercise, aerobics, jazz, mm -hmm. like these different dance um, workouts that mm -hmm. people can do. Um, how different are they from, say, social dance in terms of, you know, the physical benefits and, and just getting your heart rate up? Mm -hmm. I think classes that focus on the fitness aspect obviously have goals in mind, so a lot of times it's about sculpting the body. Now get the abs that you want to work on the quads, work on the glutes, there's specific muscle okay. groups that are being targeted. Whereas social dance, although those things are being targeted, it's not the selling point, quote unquote, or it's gotcha. not the focal point. So you may be building your glutes and things, but subconsciously, you know, you don't even know what's happening. What about yeah. ballet versus hip hop? They're both forms of dance. Mm -hmm. Are you are you getting a workout in both? Is it the same kind of thing or are they different? You're definitely getting a workout for sure. I think with ballet though, you're definitely building a lot of flexibility, which in turn will provide, you know, more strength to you overall. So you're working on splits and alignment and all of that. In hip hop though, you're really focused a lot on core strength and upper body strength primarily. And that's not just for break dancers, you know, just hip hop or crump dancers also need a certain level of upper body strength to move their arms so rapidly and aggressively. So, um, and not to say that you don't work on that within ballet and not to say that you don't work on your stretch within hip hop, but I think the focus so know, is different. So it's a different focus. That's mm -hmm. interesting. I, would, I guess when I, when I think of hip hop, I'm always thinking of how their, their legs are moving and how mm -hmm. all, like all the awesome contortion yeah. and all that. But, uh -huh. but yeah, you're right. They yeah. do a lot more, it's, it's quicker upper body. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, ballet is all about elongation and mm. finding that line mm -hmm. and placement, but again, hip hop is can we make these cool intricate shapes at a quick, rapid pace? And it does take a different muscle group to do that. So, so how does dance help with balance? Because this is something that yeah. people actually do need every single day, mm -hmm. good, strong balance. Yeah, ballet and all art forms actually uh, within dance help, you know, your balance out, but it all comes from your core, believe it or not, you know, just being able to engage at the center of your core to take nice deep breaths, to focus your eyes. You know, sometimes we call that a spotting, just to focus on one certain place across the room. So those things all coupled together really give you the balance that you're looking for. Um, we go up on releve a lot in ballet, which just means to go to your tippy toes, and we'll stay there for a very long time. So you'll see a dancer just placed, and they're on their tippy toes, and then can you go up, you know, with one leg connected to your knee, and stay on one foot, right? So there are different levels of that, and can you do that with your leg extended in the back and to the side? So as you mature through ballet, you'll obviously learn different ways to maintain your balance. Um, even in jazz and hip hop, you know, you need to be on releve to do your pirouette turns, right? So people see online all the time, like seven, eight, nine really cool turns in a row. That person has incredible balance. And again, it's all starting from spotting and really engaging your core. Your core and breathing. I hadn't considered yeah. the breathing aspect, but that's it. Well, I learned that's the hard way about part. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have to breathe. You know, it's so easy to just get tight as a dancer and want to hold every shape. But the moment you relax and just breathe into it, you'll actually increase your stretch 10 times. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the breath is very important for stretch and just for movements. So. so coordinated motion. You yeah. know, <laughs> we, we think of, you, you mentioned that ballet is good for teaching grace mm -hmm. and but yeah, for a lot of us, coordinated motion is it's yeah. really more awkward than anything. Mm -hmm. how oh, yeah, is sustaining dancing? movement, you know? Like how do you just take a moment to actually stretch your arm for a long time without your arm giving out sort of thing? So, you know, a lot of ballet is strength-based as well. I think it's a little more hidden than forms like hip-hop where, you know, it's aggressive and in your face and you can see every single muscle group working, but ballet is definitely about strength too. But again, how can you elongate and smile and look beautiful while you're holding your body in these really difficult positions for a long period of time. Look at ha looking happy, smiling, right. and, you know, so that's an entirely different thing you have to be thinking about right. there. Well, at least with hip hop, yeah, we can breathe and grunt and make faces and stuff, but with ballet, it's about how can you look, you know, mm. model-esque and statuesque while you're doing some really hard stuff. 
being able to control your personal space mm -hmm. is also an important part of dance, not just with ballroom. I think we mentioned that a mm -hmm. little bit with the kids being taught ballroom, but how, how is dance teaching that? Yeah, it teaches you to place yourself amongst other people without falling, without crashing, right? So you do become a steward over your space and you learn how close is too close before you know we collide. So it gives you um, a lot more strength within your peripheral vision as well and just understanding the space surrounding you, but also teaches you partnering skills as well. And like, what does the space look like when two people are moving in tandem together? And, you know, and dancers, again, uh, we're really creative beings, so sometimes we don't have the luxury of being in a huge space to dance. So, you know, you might go to an event and have to perform in a very tight space, and how can you still make the movement look nice but not get injured? So you learn a lot about space and how to become really big and really small when you need to be. <laughs> what are some of the mental benefits that uh, specifically youth receive, but just anyone in general from dancing? Yeah, it lets you pay a lot closer attention to detail. And I think that's important all through life. Obviously, detail is important, but dancers have an ability to look at everything at one time almost. So you're focusing on your fingertips, on your eyelids, right? Your feet, you know, everything is working in tandem. So you have a sharper attention to detail. Um, you become an excellent counter to eight because <laughs> everything is pretty much count, counted in eights. Um, so you're always counting for sure. You're paying a lot more attention to detail. And then you're remembering sequences, which really helps, especially in the older age. So as I taught senior citizens, for them it was really important to remember, you know, how do you keep a pattern going without forgetting that, right? What comes next? And as you become, you know, 80, 90 year old, it becomes really important to just sharpen those skills each and every day. So even the most simple of sequences, if you can get that as a dancer, you're gonna just sharpen your mind and your memory. So remembering the choreography is like a, a mental exercise yeah. for people. And physical too, right? Because in your brain you might know it, <laughs> but also how can you translate that to your body and you know do a show that could be an hour plus and remember all the movements. So yeah, I always say dancers have some of the sharpest memories for sure. You know, one of our viewers might be watching and, and you know, a, a lot of kids in this day and age, mm -hmm. they want to be popular, yeah. they want to be famous, <laughs> they want to be a great dancer. Is this the wrong reason to start dancing or is there a wrong reason to start dancing? That's an excellent question. You know, I can't say there's a wrong reason to start dancing, but there's a wrong reason to keep dancing, mm -hmm. right? So we all come to things in different ways, just like people come to God in different ways, right? There are a lot of ways that you can enter dance. I know for me, it was a big thing about popularity. And, you know, I actually started out uh, dancing for a television show. So that really drew me in. I'm like, this is for TV and all of these cool things. But over time, you realize that you need to have a mission for your art mm -hmm. to really sustain it, to really connect with people and to actually add something to like the artistic landscape. So yeah, you can start out for popularity and you know, a lot of guys are, oh, I wanna get the girls that way and all these things. But if that's the reason that you stay in it, then I think you should kind of reevaluate. You know, if it's just for fame or money or fortune, there are millions of other things you can do to get that, right? Right. But um, nobody's like in the arts for the money or for the fame of it, not truly. Well, Roger, we are all out of time for today. If our viewers want more information, is there somewhere they can go? Well, thank you. Yes, they can uh, check out my website, which is rogerleearts.com. And on there, I have a blog where I actually provide arts career tips and feature artists from around the world in all disciplines. So they can definitely check out some of our artists and uh, stay in touch that way. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. I know I learned something. I'm sure they did. Well, thank you for having <laughs> me. It's great. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you did learn something, and we'll see you next time on Joy in Our Town.